Okay. Hello, welcome to our channel as sisters in Zion. Our names are Antonia, Tracy, and Renee. And we have Mason on here with us tonight. We're happy to have him with us. We are excited to share our insights with all of you and we welcome you to comment below what you've learned this last week. Feel free to share this video with others as well. Um, we have some online communities that we invite you to join. Links are in the description box. One is on Discord and the other is on Facebook, both with the name Zion or Bust. Without further ado, let's get into the scriptures. Um, Messing with the screen. Are we switching here. over to the doc? Yeah. It's trying to change this. We're going to wait for the doc. It's taking a bit here. <laughs> Sorry. Why is it doing that? <laughs> waiting, waiting for the doc. Sweet. Nope. Now it's just Tracy. <laughs> This part is always thought. the most exciting because <laughs> we just kind of get lost for a little bit. We're like the lost sisters for a few minutes. <laughs> and then <laughs> like Peter then Pan's a lost boy. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. I, I'm just here for the ride. I'm along for the ride. <laughs> I don't know why it's not doing it properly here. Back in there. Do you want to just start, Renee? Sure. I would, I mean, if it were me, I would just start and then the beer, I mean, they don't have to necessarily read it. They can go and get the document. Okay. Well, let's start. I have number one. So I, I started out with John 1, 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. I love this opening verse so much. And I also love the picture frames. They're my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> this is oh, but, fancy. <laughs> it's so exciting. <laughs> um, I don't know why it's doing that, but we'll figure it out. Um, but I do. I do love this opening verse. It, it's so poetic. It's just, I, I don't know. I think it's beautiful. In the beginning was the word. For me, it evokes an image of like empty or unorganized space pre-creation. And then just in the center of that nothingness, right, is the word. And I don't know. I, I love it. Um, so what is the word? From the New Testament student manual, the word is a title of Jesus Christ found several places in the scriptures. Um, President Russell M. Nelson explained the meaning of the Savior's title, the Word. In the Greek language of the New Testament, that word was logos, or expression. It was another name for the Master. The terminology may seem strange, but it is appropriate. We use words to convey our expression to others. So Jesus was the word, or expression, of his Father to the world. The Gospel of John emphasizes that Jesus Christ is the messenger of the Father to the world. As such, he declares the Father's words. John 12, 49, For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Doctrine and Covenants 93.8, therefore in the beginning the word was, for he was the word, even the messenger of salvation, the light and the redeemer of the world. The word is also the gospel, which is the message itself, which Jesus Christ brings to the world. The JST version of John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the gospel preached through the Son, and the gospel was the word. And the word was with the son, and the son was with God, and the son was of God. Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? 
So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Or as Joseph Smith put it a bit more succinctly in the lectures on faith, faith comes by hearing the word of God. So by having the messenger of the word, we can then hear the word and begin to develop faith. The word is also descriptive of God's character. He will always keep his word. He is constant, unchanging, and perfectly reliable. Joseph Smith, Matthew 135. Although the days will come that the heaven and earth shall pass away, yet my words shall not pass away, but shall all be fulfilled. Back to the lectures on faith. Unless men have this idea that God is a being of truth, they cannot place confidence in his word. And not being able to place confidence in his word, they could not have faith in him. But believing that he is a God of truth and that his word cannot fail, their faith can rest in him without doubt. God's word is not only a pronouncement of what he will do in the future, it is also the power by which he works. Helaman 12, um, starting in verse 8, says, For behold, the dust of the earth moveth hither and thither, to the dividing, dividing asunder, at the command of our great and everlasting God. Yea, behold, at his voice do the hills and mountains tremble and quake, and by the power of his voice they are broken up and become smooth, yea, even like unto a valley. Yea, by the power of his voice doth the whole earth shake. Yea, by the power of his voice do the foundations rock, even to the very center. Yea, and if he say unto the earth, move, it is moved. Yea, if he say unto the earth, thou shalt go back, that it lengthen out the day for many hours, it is done. And thus, according to his word, the earth goeth back, and it appeareth unto man that the sun standeth still. And finally, men having faith are able to do all things by his word. Lectures on faith, again, says when a man works by faith, he works by mental exertion instead of physical force. It is by words instead of exerting his physical powers um, with which every being works when he works by faith. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Joshua spake, and the great lights which God had created stood still. Elijah commanded the heavens were stayed for the space of three years and six months so that it did not rain. He again commanded, and the heavens gave forth rain. All this was done by faith, and the Savior says, If you have a faith as, the, as a grain of mustard seed, say to this mountain, remove, and it will remove. Or say to that sycamine tree, be ye plucked up and planted in the midst of the sea, and it shall obey you. Faith, then, works by words, and with these, its mightiest works have been and will be performed. First Nephi 17.31 says, And according to his word, Moses did do all things for the children of Israel, and there was nothing, uh, there was not anything done, save it were by his word. And ending here on Moses 7. And so great was the faith of Enoch that he led the people of God and their enemies came to battle against them. And he spake the word of the Lord and the earth trembled and the mountains fled even according to his command. And the rivers of water were turned out of their course and the roar of the lions was heard out of the wilderness and all nations feared greatly. So powerful was the word of Enoch and so great was the power of the language which God had given him. So the word is Jesus Christ, and he is the messenger of the Father. He is, uh, the word is also the message itself of the gospel that he brings to us from the Father. It is his character, honest and unchanging, that men through faith, which comes by hearing the word, may be able to do all things by his word. His word is both his promise and his fulfillment, Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. In the beginning was the word, 
And as one earth shall pass away and the heavens thereof, even so shall another come. And there is no end to my works, neither to my words. That is the end of my first thought. Thanks. Um, I really enjoyed that. I, uh, I especially like the part where you mentioned the, uh, was it God's word is a pronouncement of what he will do in the future and mm -hmm. the power by which he works. Um, I don't know. It's really interesting. Like I think my section two or my insight two kind of talks a little bit more about the word. And uh, I like the way that you went about it, showing like the power of God through uh, was it um, was so powerful was the word of Enoch and so great was the power and language which God had given him and that Enoch was able to do some pretty amazing things through that power that mm -hmm. God has. And uh, today, whenever President Nelson speaks about using the priesthood power, protection by the priesthood power, uh, the power that comes through protection with the temples, it all makes me think back to these words of God where it all, and it, you know, you know in the beginning was the word, in the beginning is where it all started with Jesus Christ. And that's where it's going to end is with Jesus Christ. But yeah, anyway, I really enjoyed that insight. That was pretty, pretty neat. I, I like the way you took <clears throat> took the words. I kind of went more on like a personal level with it. So it's kind of neat to see it sort of fleshed out more among the power of God with, with the prophets too. But Yeah, this one was a fun one to write because as I was writing, I was like, oh, it really just feels like it highlights the one eternal round, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Like it's like the beginning and the end and the promise and the fulfillment and it's just kind of circular. Yes. So yeah, yeah that was a fun one for me. I just really like the concept that faith works by words. Um, like when we have the confidence enough in like the scriptures and when we have the confidence enough like in what we say and um, the desires that we have in our, with in our heart then we can say words and it will happen um, because faith works by words. And I, I really love that. And I, I hope that I can grow into that principle as I, as I study and as I gain faith and knowledge um, uh, of the things that I can, I can make it happen based upon, you know, the things that I can say. I don't know if that made sense, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but that's one of my favorite lines actually in the lectures on faith. Yeah. And that also feels like a circular concept to me because um, sometimes I think, well, okay, so I'm talking about myself, <laughs> my younger self, um, focus more on like the saying to a mountain, you know, be moved and the mountain moves, right? I'm like, well, but the other side of that is doing what you say you will do, right? So if I say mm -hmm. I'm going to do something, do I actually do it? Like, I, can I control me first? And then as I do that, and as I gain trust with the Lord, then I will be able to do greater things through yeah. his word. Right. And mm -hmm. so it's this kind of, yeah. Keeping your word, doing things through words, being true to your word and honest in your word. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of, is it Moroni 7, verse 33? I, it's one of my favorite scriptures. Oh, man, I hope I don't botch it. I should probably just look it up. I got a computer in front of me. But uh, it, it says, uh, and Christ, ha Christ hath said, um, whichever, uh, what service ex expedient in me you shall have the power or something. I'm going to have to look it up. I just totally butchered that. But uh, whatever is expedient in me, you'll have the power. If you have faith, you'll have the power to do it. Um, along those lines. And it kind of reminds me of what you'd mentioned there, like having that faith, if we have the faith to do God's work or uh, to listen to God's words, we're going to do his work. And it's like, I think of like serving a mission, like how, when I was young going on, I'm like, I'm 19. I'm from a tiny little town of a thousand or a couple thousand people. How the heck am I going to convert people to the gospel? And you just, you learn the word, you, you gain a testimony of it and you just act and do it and you speak and you trust in that word. Mm -hmm. um hopefully that made sense but i'll have to look up that scripture so i i feel really bad watching it but <laughs> um because it's my favorite one and now i'm put on the spot and i cannot remember but anyways i'll pull it up here in a second but 
Well, I think you're next also, Mason. He oh, is. Me? I don't know if you want to roll into your first one. Sure. Hmm. Um, let's see here. Just lost the thing. Okay. <clears throat> so I started off with um, John chapter 1, verses 4 through 10. And so I just decided to kind of focus more on the light. Uh, which is which is spoken of by John here. And I'll start by reading verses four uh, through 10. It says, in him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shineth in the darkness and the darkest comprehended, comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. A person, and this is my words, a person that is filled with darkness cannot fully comprehend the things of God. Therefore, it is necessary that we need to focus on our Savior and fill ourselves with light. From that light comes truth, knowledge, understanding, and a greater sense of purpose towards our roles and responsibilities as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In Doctrine and Covenants, section 88, verse 67, it says, and if your eye be single to, to my glory, your whole body shall be filled with light, and there shall be no darkness in you, and that body which is filled with light comprehendeth all things. Now, this following quote from Elder Theodore Tuttle, sub, I feel, sums up perfectly my thoughts on John 1, 4 through 10, and in respect to light versus darkness, truth versus lies, and the Savior versus Satan. Uh, so to quote Elder Tuttle, the light of God shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. Nevertheless, the day shall come when you shall comprehend even God, being quickened in him and by him. Then shall ye know that ye have seen me, that I am, and that I am the true light that is in you, and that you are in me, otherwise ye could not abound. There is a great promise in these words for those who seek the light of truth. We need not to think that the light of God is limited to only the things of the Spirit. We are taught that the light which shineth, which giveth you light, is through him who enlighteneth your eyes, which is the same light that quickeneth your understandings, through Christ, our spiritual gifts are refined and perfected. Those are my words. <clears throat> now back to Elder Tuttle. Which light proceedeth forth from the presence of God to fill the immensity of space? The light which is in all things, which giveth life to all things, which is the law by which all things are governed, even the power of God who sitteth upon his throne, who is in the bosom of eternity, who is in the midst of all things. Christ's light, or God's light includes the physical light we see, which makes us feel so warm and comfortable. God's light is also the power to understand and comprehend all things. In other words, all kinds of light are related to intelligence and truth. This is substantiated by modern revelation, which teaches us more about Jesus Christ, who is he that ascended up on high, as also he descended below all things, and that he comprehended all things, that he might be in all and through all things the light of truth. Which truth shineth, this truth is the light of Christ. And also he is the sun and the light of the sun and the power thereof, which it was made by. And he is also the moon and is the light of the moon and the power thereof, which was, which it was made. And also the light of the stars and the power thereof, which they were made. And the earth also and the power thereof, even the earth upon which you stand. The light of Christ therefore includes not only spiritual light, but also a physical light. And is a key to understanding that form of energy, which is represented by the light we see all around us. Satan is that wicked one who comes to take away light and truth from the children of men through their disobedience and because of the traditions of their fathers. But the Lord has commanded us to bring up our children in light and truth. And the opposite of light is darkness and the opposite of truth is falsehood. That close quote from Elder Tuttle. And then I'll just share one more quote with Brigham Young. When true doctrines are advanced, though they may be new to hearers, yet the principles contained therein are perfectly natural and easy to, to be understood so much so that the hearers often imagine that they had always known them. This arises from the influence of the spirit of truth upon the spirit of intelligence that is within each person. The influence that comes from heaven is all the time, all the time teaching the children of men. And the close quote from President Brigham Young. And that's the end of my first insight. I love light. Mm -hmm. um, it just illuminates everything. 
Um, and I love that he's the light of the world. I always think of when, when we're talking about the light of the world, I remember um, just a little experience that I had during Christmas when we were going to see the, the Christmas lights um, at one of these venues. And I told Angela, my daughter, that um, the lights of, of Christmas represent Christ because he is the light of the world. So whenever we see Christmas lights, we should think of Christ. And I just love like just the simplicity of that um, and teaching, you know, my three-year-old. Um, but that, you know, light is so easily perceived because once it appears, it chases away the darkness. Um, and now if we choose the darkness, then the light obviously goes, goes away and is diminished. Um, but generally speaking, I don't know many people who like to be in the dark. <laughs> like people generally are searching for the light. And so um, to, to know that Jesus Christ is the light that we, um, ultimately search out for is, is super helpful to know how we can live our life and what the direction is that we need to be going. Um, and given the light of Christ is given to every man, um, and, and works on us to bring us to, um, the gospel of Jesus Christ, um, and understanding that concept, it's, it's helpful when we're working with people either of our faith or not that um we're we know that we're all like on the same team we are all have like the same base start if that makes sense and so we can help each other reach more light um as we you know study and work together yes Does that makes sense love the light <laughs> Like yes. I'm rambling here. <laughs> no, I love the light because for me it gives me this concept of, you know, you're in a room and the lights off, and as you go in, you know, um, if you're not prepared, you're kind of blinded at first mm, because you can't, yeah. you can't um, find yourself in there. Um, so it takes you a while to get acclimated um, to the light, or even from inside to outside because it's just so bright. And it takes a while for you to acclimate. And I think it's the same with, you know, us learning the scriptures also, because it's just as the principles are taught, like Mason said, those, those doctrines are, you know, it's line by line, you know, precept by precept here, a little, there a little. And, and, and that's how it is because you can't, cons you, you can't possibly consume it all at once because you have to build on that. And so that's, well, that's the perception with light for me is like, you're, in complete darkness you know you you're not going to handle the light well it's going to take you a while to you know learn that it's okay and um mm -hmm. and then you get to where i guess us and as we are in zion or bus we want more light we're thriving on it we want more we want more and we keep seeking that and uh, we can handle it because we've already built upon um the the concepts and the truths that we've learned thus far yeah, I was just going to say, going off of that, like how Joseph Smith, um, you know, built upon that, you know, he starts with his glory, man glorious manifestation and the sacred growth. And, you know, he, he gets more and more and more and eventually gets to the point where he can just stand it. But I, one of the revelations, I think it was section 76, when afterward, you know, Sidney Rignan just goes limp because he hadn't grown into that, that principle of, of um, light. Um so I, I love to see that in, in those kinds of examples and the, yes. the way that we can work up to it as well. Just as Antonio was saying. Absolutely. Sydney says, Sydney isn't as used to it as I am. <laughs> yes, that's what he yeah, said. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Spot on. Well, I, I like that. I threw that last quote in there from Brigham Young because I like what he said at the end there, that the influence that comes from heaven is all the time teaching the children of men. Mm -hmm. So that we know that the light of Christ is in everything. He was the creator of the world. And so God's truth is, is in his word. It's in that light. And when it shines forth or when someone bears testimony or teaches truth, like we're, we're always having those experiences to learn and to grow. And, but it's, yeah, it's like, like you said, it's just little by little line upon line, precept by precept, but that's why I tossed that one in there. I, I thought that was great. It's a way to summarize I, at that point. Yeah, I love that. I 
I was just thinking it's awesome that we will continue to learn. Like that's exciting to me, you know, like I'm really looking forward to getting, you know, the sealed, sealed portions of our scriptures. And, and also when you mentioned the, uh, Joseph Smith, Sydney Ringan experience, Tracy, I was also thinking, you know, this is part of, um, part of our sanctification and preparation for, for the day of the Lord, right? Cause he's going to come in his brightness and his glory and who will be able to stand mm -hmm. the children of light, right? The people who have worked up and built up principle upon principle to the point that we can comprehend it. Be like Joseph in the story, mm -hmm. right? And say, oh, yeah, we're used to it. <laughs> cool. Yeah, that would be really awesome. I, I'm in the same. I'm like, yes, give me the sealed portion. Give me more. I want more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I'll oh. jump into okay. mine then. Um, my first insight is called witnesses. So we've got John 1, uh, 35, 36, 37, 40, and 41. Again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. One of the two who heard John and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. If you're looking at this document, um, the green is the Joseph Smith translation and the cross out is what is in the King James Version. Um, he fi first findeth his own brother, Simon, and saith unto him, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. So my commentary, in these scriptures, you can see several things happening. One, John the Baptist had disciples, meaning they followed his teachings, which we know were based upon scripture and revelation. Two, John bears witness of the true person to follow, even the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Three, two of the disciples of John heard John's testimony and no longer followed after him, but after Jesus, because they were never attached to the man, but to the doctrine. And then number four, after following the savior and feeling the testimony born of the spirit, one of the disciples, one disciple went and bore witness to his brother. In the come follow me manual, it says, have you ever wondered whether you would have recognized Jesus of Nazareth as the son of God, if you had been living, if he had been alive during his mortal ministry for years, Faithful Israelites, including Andrew, Peter, Philip, and Nathaniel, had waited and prayed for the coming of the promised Messiah. When they met him, how did they know that he was the one they had been seeking? The same way all of us come to know the Savior, by accepting the invitation to come and see for ourselves. My commentary. We ourselves, um, what did I write here? Have also, I think that's supposed to say have also. <laughs> Also, <laughs> have we not midnight ramblings, guys, midnight ramblings. <laughs> hey, we ourselves have also been waiting for years, and I hope that we are waiting patiently, being anxiously engaged in the cause and praying daily, day and night for deliverance from our Babylonian captivity. We Are we avoiding being lazy learners and lax disciples by thoroughly studying the scriptures and knowing who Jesus Christ is through the through what they teach? Are we having encounters with the spirit being sanctified him and having testimony born by, by him of the savior to fortify our own foundation so that when the whirlwinds of the devil come, we will not be moved. Will we be able to see the savior as he is because we have become like him through developing the attributes of him so that his image is reflecting in our countenances. And when all of this happens, will we be found upon the watchtower proclaiming the doctrine to those around us so that we, so that they can take the same straight and narrow path towards exaltation, which is the work and glory of God. None of the above can happen if human testimony does not play a part. Joseph Smith teaches in the lectures on faith, which apparently is a theme running through tonight. We have now clearly set forth how it is and how it was that God became an object of faith for rational beings. And also upon the foundation, the testimony was based, which excited the inquiry and diligent search of the ancient saints to seek after and obtain a knowledge of the glory of God. And we have seen that it was human testimony and human testimony only that excited this inquiry. And I'll just stop there. So <clears throat> John's testimony left no doubt that he knew of his own divinely appointed preparatory mission and the divinity of the preferred one who would come after him. And that's from the New Testament student manual. So my commentary, John essentially had had his patriarchal blessing and knew the roles that he was foreordained to play during his mortal probation. We are no different. We can make the same choices that John did to stay true to the doctrine, proclaim the gospel and fulfill 
the missions or objectives that we have in this life to fulfill. The impact that the testimony that John shared is priceless. He was sent to prepare the way, and that is exactly what he did. In the New Testament student manual, um, President Dallin H. Oaks um, speaks of why testimonies of divine truths, we should share those with others. He says, those who have a testimony of the restored gospel also have a duty to share it. The Book of Mormon teaches that we should stand as witnesses of God at all times and in all things and in all places that we may be in. One of the most impressive teachings on the relationship between the gift of, of a testimony and the duty to bear it is in the 46th section of the Doctrine and Covenants. Those who have the gift to know have an obvious duty to bear their witness so that those who have the gift to believe on their words might also have eternal life. There has never been a greater need for us to profess our faith privately and publicly. Though some profess atheism, there are many who are open to additional truths about God. To these sincere seekers, we need to affirm the existence of God, the eternal Father, the divine mission of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the reality of the restoration. We must be valiant in our testimony of Jesus. So my commentary, what does what happens to those who are not valiant in their testimonies of Jesus? Let's just take that for a minute. In Doctrine and Covenants 76, we read, Wherefore they are they are bodies terrestrial and not bodies celestial, and differ in glory as the moon differs from the sun. These are they who are not valiant in the testimony of Jesus. Wherefore, they obtain not the crown over the kingdom of our God. So if you look up valiant in the dictionary, it says um, primarily strong, brave, uh, courageous, heroic, performed with valor. Synonym, synonyms to valiant are fearless, indomitable, strong-willed, bold, steadfast, stalwart, undaunted, and worthy. A testimony. This is taken from um, Bruce R. McConkie's Mormon Doctrine. It says, a testimony is sure knowledge received by revelation from the Holy Ghost of the divinity of the great Latter-day work. If the sole source of one's knowledge or assurance of the truth of the Lord's work comes from reason or logic or persuasive argument that cannot be controverted, it is not a testimony of the gospel. It is the promptings of the spirit rather than reason alone that is the true foundation upon which the testimony rests. In Revelation 9, 19, it says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So to be valiant in the testimony of Jesus is to be stalwart, undaunted, unwavering in the witness that he has borne to us by the Holy Ghost concerning the divinity of the Savior, his gospel, his prophet, and his church. If we falter in any one of those things, then we are not valiant. This means that we make and keep covenants. If we do not, then we forfeit the blessings associated with those covenants unless we repent. And that can only take place on this earth. The work and glory of the Father is to bring to pass the eternal life of man, a.k.a. celestial glory, a.k.a. exaltation, which is only achieved in the highest degree of the celestial kingdom. That's the goal. So the Lord is going to go to great lengths to help us understand what our duties are to get there. President Oaks said just in this last um, general, is it last general conference? I didn't. I didn't write down the, the um, I think it was actually in 2020. He said, the Lord has chosen to reveal comparatively little about these two kingdoms, two of these kingdoms of glory. In contrast, the Lord has revealed much about the highest kingdom of glory. Why would this be? Because he doesn't want us to aim for lower glories, but the highest. He has given us enough information to judge righteously, however. Jesus Christ said in 3rd Nephi, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way which leadeth to the destruction, and many there be who go in there at because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it so all that is all that being said and laid before us let us evaluate where we find ourselves in terms of being witnesses for christ do people know where our source of hope joy and perseverance comes from let's go to matthew 5 Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on an hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I know that the Savior lives. I know that he was the firstborn of the Father and the only begotten of the Father in the flesh. And he is our only means of salvation in the highest glory if we prove ourselves faithful to the end. I know that he is no respecter of persons, and he gives every opportunity to us that is just and merciful according to our circumstances. I know that he lived and then suffered for all of our sins, weaknesses, agonies, agonies etc., in the Garden of Gethsemane, that we not, need not suffer if we repent. I know that he was crucified on the cross and gave his life for each one of us, and I know that he raised himself on the third day, and he lives now. I know that he is the head of this church, and he will be the king of this world. 
I pray that I may be worthy to live with him in this kingdom with my eternal family. And I also pray that I may be a witness continually that people may know um, the, the, the fountain, the, the source of my joy. And I say that, in the, or I share my first insight with you. That ends that first insight. I loved that. I, I loved how you focused on um, like the testimony of John. Because every time that I read this part of the scriptures, I just think it's awesome that he, he is bearing witness of Christ's light, right? So he's, he's out there and he has all these people that's fault. They're following him. And some of the disciples who later become apostles for Christ were kind of following John right at the beginning. And then when Christ comes, John's like, follow him, you know, <laughs> like I'm not yeah. trying to build a following for me. I'm shining light. And, um, made me think of a conference talk that I really like that's um it's that they may see um by sister Corden from 2020 and she has this story about like um elder L. Tom Perry comes to visit them and she's she, you know she's young and she's like an apostle's coming and but she has to feed the chickens and so she's going out there and elder Perry's like well I'll come with you and so they're going out there and she has this flashlight and she's shining it everywhere, but he can't see where he's going. So he trips and then she feels bad or something like that. <laughs> and, and so her point of the story is you can't just generally shine light <laughs> into the world. You have to focus the light mm -hmm. on that, right? Like focus the light on, on Christ. And I think that's exactly what John does yep. is he focuses on Christ and and that's what his whole testimony is of. Well, and we don't have like record of any of his um, disciples that, you know, didn't follow Jesus, or maybe we do, and I'm not thinking of it, but I just really love that, you know, once he started bearing testimony of Jesus Christ, that true testimony of the light, you mm -hmm. see these disciples that were of John's go right over to Christ, because if they're following the scriptures and they're following what, what John is actually saying, then John is not the source. Right. Christ is the source. And now he's actually here, which I'm going to be getting into next uh, in my next insight about like scriptures and what we look for. But I just think that's incredible that, you know, even if, if even if there's somebody who does help us see the light, who is that testimony, just as John is that ultimately that person, if he's true and faithful, isn't going to be, you know, drawing attention to himself he's always or herself he's always going to be or she's always going to be pointing to christ mm -hmm. and that's where we see um you know the the whole thing with priestcraft like we we don't want to be the source of truth we just want to be this uh, 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 an avenue that that source of light that people know where to look to find the truth who is christ who is the word <laughs> It uh, when you were reading through that, being a witness, the, the talk from President Nelson, the price of priesthood power kept running over in my head because um, I it's something I've been thinking about a lot recently over the last year is basically what is that price to pay for priesthood power for that protection? Um, and just one little line I'll read from it. I looked it up, so I won't botch it this time, but <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, he says, I, I urgently plead with each of us to live up to our privileges as bearers of the priesthood. In a coming day, only those men who have taken their priesthood seriously by diligently seeking to be taught by the Lord himself will be able to bless, guide, protect, strengthen, and heal others. And only a man who has paid the price for priesthood power will be able to bring miracles to those he loves and keep his marriage and his family safe now and throughout eternity. Um, and I've been studying this talk a lot lately, and one scripture I connected to it um, was oddly enough it came up through the old testament and i think you guys actually talked about this um in one of your as sister and zion episodes uh but it's from lamentations 4 2 <clears throat> and this when i read this it like lamentations was kind of heartbreaking <laughs> i really like i was really sad reading through that but um so in chapter 4 verse 2 it says the precious sons of zion comparable to fine gold 
how are they esteemed as earthen pitchers, the work of the hand, the work of the hands for the, of the potter? First, the sons of Zion, once compared to fine gold, had become inferior vessels like those made of earthen clay. And that part's from the student manual. And so when I think about being a witness of Christ, being someone like John who continuously brought people in, but like you said, he just pointed them to the Savior, to Christ, and didn't shine himself as a light and charge money for it. You know, <laughs> that's terrible. I just still can't get over that sometimes. But um, but to really have that priesthood power to pay that price for that, I think it comes with being a witness of Christ, being a missionary, testifying it, seeking him after him daily and learning from him through the light, through the power of the Holy Ghost, seeking to be taught by Christ himself. And I think we're able to really access into some of that power and receive protection because we'll be acting in accordance to his will and bringing other people unto Christ too. And they will in turn do the same, just like his disciples did. But anyways, those are my kind of thoughts on it. But I thought it was awesome. Thank you. All right, Antonio, are you ready? Are you ready? Yes, for this? I'm ready. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, make note of what you put here that on your testimony here that he is no respecter of persons and he gives every opportunity to us that is just and merciful according to our circumstances. I love that. Um, I felt, um, you know, a nudging when I when I read um, this uh, section in John 1, verse 14, 16, and 17, and um, emphasis on his uh, grace and truth. It says, and the same word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. For in the beginning was the word, even the Son who made who is made flesh and sent unto us by the will of the Father. And as many believed on his name shall receive of his fullness, and of his fullness have all we received, even immortality and eternal life through his grace. For the law was given through Moses, but life and truth came through Jesus Christ. In the student manual for this section, um, it says, the only time in the New Testament when Jesus Christ is described as being full of grace and truth is in John 1.14. Latter-day scriptures describe the Savior as being full of grace and truth an additional seven times. The Savior shares with us his fullness as described in John 1, 16 and 17, including his grace, which he freely gives to us. The Greek word charis, from which grace is translated, can also be understood to mean loving kindness, goodwill, or favor. The main idea of the word is, div is divine means of help or strength given through the bounteous mercy and love of Jesus Christ. This grace is an enabling power that allows men and women to lay hold of eternal life and exaltation after they have expended their own best efforts. He also mentions uh, the Greek word, aletheia, from which truth is translated, which means fact, reality, or certainty. The Lord defines truth as knowledge of things as they are and as they were and as they are to come. Truth is absolute and is not influenced by circumstances, does not change at, just as the Lord does not change. And then these are some of the references also that they give here in uh, DNC 9330. Uh, it says all truth is dependent in that sphere in which God has placed it to act for itself as all intelligence also. Otherwise, there is no non-existence or no existence. And in Mormon 919, and if there were miracles wrought then, why has God ceased to be a God of miracles, yet be an unchangeable being? And behold, I say unto you, he changes not. If so, he would cease to be God and ceases not to be God and is a God of miracles. And in Doctrine and Covenants 2017, it uh, reads, By these things we know that there is a God in heaven who is infinite and eternal from everlasting to everlasting, the same unchangeable God, the framer of heaven and earth and all things which are in them. So my emphasis here right now at this point is I want to uh, emphasize here um, full of grace and what grace really is uh, what I wanted to focus on. I found a talk uh, by John Taylor and bear with me and read uh, a section of his uh, talk. And he was talking about sustaining the authorities. But uh, when Jesus was here in on the earth, 
And when he was about to leave his disciples, he knew what the powers of darkness were, for he had battled with them. And indeed, he was able to do so, having been anointed with the oil of gladness above his fellows. But notwithstanding this and the fact of his being the only begotten of the Father, yet when he came to wrestle with the difficulties he had to cope with, he sweat great drops of blood and said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. I shrink to encounter the things to have to cope with, but nevertheless, not my will, but thine will, but thine be done. So um, President Taylor goes on to say, now we have to pass through a variety of things. Many of us are tried and tempted and we get harsh and hard feelings against one another. And it reminds me of your teens when going downhill with a heavy load. When the load begins to crowd on top of the horses, you will frequently see one snap at his mate and the other will prick up his ears and snap back again. And why? A little while before, perhaps they were, they were playing with each other because the load crowds on them. Well, when the load begins to crowd, do not snap at your brethren, but let them feel that you are their friends and pull together. Says Jesus with reference to his disciples, Father, I pray thee that these be may be one, I in them and thou in me, that thy spirit, O God, that dwells in thee, and that thou that hast imparted unto me might also dwell in them, that their hearts may be united together by the bonds of eternal life and fellowship and priesthood, that they may feel after one another's welfare and seek to promote another one's happiness. We have drunk of that river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of our God, that it may arise and flow and bubble in our hearts, and that its vivifying streams may be felt everywhere we go, that the influence and light and power and spirit and intelligence of God may be with us, that we may be one according to the prayer of our Lord. As I, the Father, am in thee, thou and thou in me, that the world may know that thou hast sent me. These principles are as eternal as the heavens. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, this is grace in action. I've uh, been studying and enjoying Elder Bednar's book. It's, I'm going to just show you. I don't know if you can see it. Can't see it. Look at the invisible book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's some, that's some that's fancy editing book. there. <laughs> that's a fancy book. Uh, oh, well, maybe that way you can see it. Well, anyway, this book is called um, Increasing Learning, and it says Spiritual Patterns for Obtaining Your Own Answers. In this book, he teaches that first you need to obtain knowledge, and then it becomes understanding when the Holy Ghost confirms it in your heart as true as what we know in our minds. And he says it kind of just moves from our heads to our hearts by thoughts and feelings that are put into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And then we gain intelligence by righteous application of knowledge and understanding in action and judgment. In the above example that John Taylor, we see how easily the saints could fall into being harsh and having hard feelings against one another. I pray that we can do as he recommends, you know, to let us continue to pull together that we may feel after another one's welfare and seek to promote one another's happiness. Since we have drunk of that river, the streams whereof make glad the city of our God. And again, this speaks all of Zion and making that happen. And how we make that happen is that um, brings him back to your reference, um, Tracy, where you said, would we recognize the Savior? You know, would we know um, um, if it was him, like like the, the, the apostles that well, then they weren't apostles but they were now followers and they knew that they had found the messiah um and how do we do that and and um we're not going to be perfect obviously we're gonna we're gonna have uh, these these um um uh, misunderstandings or or feelings or and i see sometimes in discord where you know there's like you know back and forth but not in a bad way, in a good way. We're, you know, trying to, I guess, flesh out the different um, understanding that we have. And sometimes it's like Elder Bednar says, at first, you know, we have this knowledge of, you know, the scriptures and then he, the, the spirit then as we uh, subject ourselves 
to the spirit and say, you know, I, I you know, I need um, understanding. And then he will uh, or, uh, reveal that to us in a way that we can, we ourselves will know. And then we are then um, able to uh, understand and have that light or that intelligence and apply it and say, oh, this is how um, I, I'm applying it uh, righteously. In other words, uh, attending to my brothers and sisters in this way, like you were saying, not just by um, lifting up your voice and saying, you know, um, here's my understanding of the scriptures and then I'm done with that. No, that means like every minute of every day in practicing, not only um, verbally, but also in, in your presence when you, uh, where, where you're at and how the people that you affect. One of the things that um, um, in my profession that I retired, actually it's gonna be a year now that I retired, one of the things that um, uh, that the um, we have a team of uh, of um, 12, 15 people that would go into the OR and um, uh, later I did they 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 told me we always knew when you went in, when you were in the OR we always knew when you would walk in and the reason was is because all of the revelry that was going on evidently prior to me being in there would cease <laughs> when I would get there. And they told me this later. I, I didn't know at that time, but apparently prior to me being there, they would, they were, you know, pretty rude and um, vulgar. But when I would go in there, you know, the, the, the surgeon, you know, had made it very clear that everyone was to cease because I was, I was present. And, and I didn't know that they revealed it to me later, like I said, and uh, um, that's how we should have, um, with that people should know that you're this person that, you know, has these principles or you, that you this is the, how you conduct yourselves and they're, they're uh, reverent uh, because of, of uh, how you conduct in your life. And it should be that in everywhere. Um, and people should ask like, what's that like? What's what, um, and, and it gives you an opportunity to, to extend those things to them. Anyway, so um, that was uh, what I had um, for uh, uh, that section on John. Yeah, something in that last little bit is is kind of what you touched on, like what a testimony actually is. Like it's not just us reasoning. It's not just us using the scriptures. It's a, a witness born to us by the Holy Ghost of the truthfulness of what we're reading. And so then it becomes, then we become converted, right? Not just knowing, but also becoming whatever it is that we're reading. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I really loved how you tied in full of grace and truth with working together because grace and truth like you you kind of have like the you know truth is a standard truth is unchanging right but then you have this grace which is this enabling you know helping so that you can meet the standard right so I'm like, how do we apply that to our working together? Well, we don't lower our standard, <laughs> right? It's like, we, we still have the truth. We still have the standard, but then we have this grace enabling, helping, you know, pulling together, being yoked together, right? To do that and how those, those two principles kind of work together. Yeah. I touch more on that in my third, my third insight. Yeah like the savior makes up the you know mm -hmm. the extra part you know yeah. <laughs> he, he enables us to do that i mean I, I i've seen you know in so many circumstances where you're just like oh lord i need some grace to be able to help um this person because <laughs> i don't want to do it <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, um, never <laughs> that's, you know and that's being honest you know because you know a lot of times you know we, we have that you know that nature in us that needs to you know also be subjected and you know we need to we need to um come to terms with it you know yeah i like that uh quote you shared by john taylor <clears throat> with the <clears throat> when like they feel the load creeping up on them and they just start snapping at their brethren and they have to remember like take, take it easy it's not their fault like there's there's a load being pushed on our backs here let's work together and get this down safely and i kind of feel like we're at that point today 
with everything that's going on in the world, with the iniquity, the cup running over, the Assyrians just come at us hard, <laughs> you know, and it's it feels like that load is encroaching upon us fast and hard. And we're going down that hill and it's like, all right, we could we can curse God and die, or we can start cursing each other and fall apart like pieces, it, it, like glass. Or, you know, we can calm down and find people that we can work with, get together and just make sure that load gets down safely and that we just save as many people along the way. And I kind of feel like Discord's been like that for me, finding that group of people. Like that coupled with the Old Testament Come Follow Me this year has really helped define to me what Israel actually is and what the work of God actually is and how to follow the will of God is is gathering the gatherers, getting together with, with scattered Israel through means of communications, however it may be, <laughs> and, and working and testifying together and, and helping each other. So I, I really enjoyed that quote. I That was something I could really relate to. But yeah, I don't it's know a, if that makes sense. But Oh, it's a real visual, you know, because, you know, when they when you're yoked together, a lot of times we think it's just, you know, you carrying the load and you're just like, and you have to realize that it's the same load and that we're yeah. all carrying it, you know, and it's in a different way that we're doing it, but it's the same load. And so, yeah, it's real easy to just say like, but mine's heavier, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, you know, I have. Well, automatic. and that brings to mind one of my favorite scriptures in Matthew, <laughs> where it says that, um, if you uh, take my burden upon you, you know, my, my burden is light and easy to be, to be born. Um, I, you know, Mason, I just butchered that scripture, but it's in Matthew 11. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and so if my we're, we're yoked together, light. but we also, yeah, we also need to be yoked <sighs> to Christ, right? Um, cause if we're trying to do it our own way and not the way Christ has set forth, then we're also going to have troubles, even if we, yep think that we're doing it together. Does that make sense? Yeah. We have to do it the Lord's way as well. And so I really like that because his burden is light. He's already, he's already borne the burden for us. Um, we just need to be or do what he's asked us to do. Yeah. Well, it's kind of, it kind of reminds me of like when we were growing up, you know, and, and, um, you know, house cleaning, it was like one of those things that you, you if you didn't do it, you didn't have, you know, you couldn't go anywhere or do anything, you know, and, you know, the, my brothers there, they were not very helpful, you know, if anything, they just made it more difficult, but, you know, it, it, it was an all or nothing thing, you know, it, it was either all done and some, mm -hmm. you know, would get privileges or not. And, um, that was a difficult thing to do a lot of times because you had brothers that were, well, at least my brothers and, you know, they weren't helpful. In fact, they were, you know, causing more problems, but nonetheless, <laughs> you know, we, you know, it, it's that same principle is just that it's, it's, it's an all effort, you know, not just one individual. And um, however, in the end, it has to show that we're doing it together. You know, mm -hmm. it's a teamwork, just like he says in, uh, the Savior says, you know, that um, I am in thee and thou in me, you know, and he wants us to be like he is with the Father, you know, and it's hard for us to set ourselves aside and make us understand, you know, that our brother's needs, if we're ultimately, you know, being like the Savior and emulating the Savior, our brother's needs and um feelings and everything are going to be more important than our own as Christ's example has shown us. And so, um, yeah, it's a difficult thing, but um, it's possible through his grace. Love it. And we're up to Ooh, Renee, you're up. Starting the number twos. Don't, don't say it like that. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded fine until you said something about it. <laughs> I was Sorry, ready I had ready children. My, my, my life revolved around um, number twos. So 
I did not even understand why that was a bad thing until you just explained it. Like, okay. <laughs> Is it hot in here? <laughs> <laughs> I heard Topher has good editing skills. He can Sorry. fix that. So. <laughs> Starting. Well, uh, no. Go ahead, Renee. I'm, I'm not gonna. Yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna further this along here. Go, Renee. <laughs> so, from the Come Follow Me manual, <laughs> although we are all spirit sons and sons and daughters of God the Father. When we sin, we become estranged or separated from him. Jesus Christ offers us a way back through his atoning sacrifice. Ponder what John 1, 11 through 13 teaches about becoming sons and daughters of God. Consider also what these scriptures teach about how we receive this gift. What does it mean to you to have power to become a son or daughter of God? So John 1 11 through 13 says he came unto his own and his own received him not but as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of god even to them who believe on his name which were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man but of god so what defines those who are born of god and given power to become his sons and daughters as many as received him. And how do we receive him? Doctrine and Covenants 39.5 says, And fairly, verily, I say unto you, He that receiveth my gospel receiveth me. And he that receiveth not my gospel receiveth not me. Doctrine and Covenants 25.1 says, For verily, I say unto you, All those who receive my gospel are sons and daughters in my kingdom. So to receive the Savior, we must receive the gospel. But what does it mean to receive? If you look at the word receive in the index to the triple combination, you'll find under C also the words accept, partake, obtain, and reap. Um, I didn't actually write this out, but as I was pondering those words, I actually... Um, like I had a mental image of a parent holding out, like, we'll say a strawberry to a child. Right. So, so as you think about those words, I'm like, okay, so if, if you're holding out, holding it out and saying here, accept it, right. You, you just take it in your hand and you've accepted it. You have it. But then partake kind of denotes another layer where, okay, I have it in my hand, but am I experiencing all the blessings? Mm -hmm. No, not until I actually partake of it, not until I eat it, then I then I have the flavor and the nutrients and all that. Um, and then obtain and reap, reap especially, I think, okay, um, here's a bucket. I want you to go receive those ripe strawberries that are in the garden, right? Now you have to go do something to receive them. Or if you go all the way to reap, you know, maybe, maybe you you have seeds and, and you want to receive the bounty and you have to like do everything to get them. Anyway, so like there's these different levels of what it means to receive something and how passive or active um, our part is required to be, right? So, okay, so then going forward into Doctrine and Covenants 41.5, he that receiveth my law and doeth it the same as my disciple. And he saith, and he that saith he receiveth it, and doeth it not, the same is not my disciple, and shall be cast out from among you. Joseph Smith, in teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, said, All men who become heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ will have to receive the fullness of the ordinances of his kingdom. And those who will not receive all the ordinances will come short of the fullness of that glory if they do not lose the whole. Then going into Mosiah 5, says King Benjamin, in verse 7, And now, because of the covenant which ye have made, ye shall be called the children of Christ, his sons and daughters. For behold, this day he hath spiritually begotten you. 
For you say in your hearts that you are changed through faith on his name. Therefore, you are born of him and have become his sons and his daughters. And under this head, ye are made free. And there is no other head whereby ye can be made free. There is no other name given whereby salvation cometh. Therefore, I would that ye should take upon you the name of Christ. All you that have entered into the covenant with God, that ye should be obedient unto the end of your lives. And it shall come to pass that whosoever doeth this shall be found at the right hand of God, for he shall know the name by which he is called, for he shall be called by the name of Christ. This is President Joseph F. Smith from 1900. It matters not how many good things we may hear, nor how much we may know, if we do not apply the instructions we receive and the knowledge we possess to the accomplishment of the work that we have at hand. The paramount duty is to labor for Zion and work for our own salvation, that we may gain victory over ourselves and over the powers of evil that are in the world. The gospel has been preached to us, and we have essayed to obey it, that we might become the sons and daughters of God, heirs of God, and joint heirs with his son. Quickly here at the end, I wanted to go a little bit into one of the gospel covenants uh, that we covenant to obey is the law of consecration. And I love this talk. It's President Marion G. Romney. He says, whenever the Lord has had a people who would accept and live the gospel, he has established the united order. He established it among the people of Enoch, of whom the record says, the Lord blessed the land and they were blessed upon the mountains and upon the high places and did flourish. And the Lord called his people Zion because they were of one heart and one mind and dwelt in righteousness and there was no poor among them. The united order exalts the poor and humbles the rich. In the process, both are sanctified. The poor released from bondage uh, released from the bondage and humiliating limitations of poverty, are enabled as free men to rise to their full potential, both temporally and spiritually. The rich, by consecration and by imparting of their surplus for the benefit of the poor, not by constraint, but willingly as an act of free will, evidence that charity for their fellow men characterized by Mormon as the pure love of Christ. In this way, they qualify to become the sons of God. And then ending with Moroni 7. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, pray unto the Father with all the energy of heart that ye may be filled with this love, charity, which he hath bestowed upon all who are true followers of his Son, Jesus Christ, that ye may become the sons of God, that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, that we may have this hope that we may be purified even as he is pure. Amen. Yeah, I, I just combine uh, Antonia's with yours and uh, you're going you're gonna to have mine. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it's going to go at the end. Um, I, I love the concept of becoming a child of Christ um, because everybody's a child of God mm -hmm. to become a child of Christ is something special. It's, I mean, that really is our trophy. <laughs> You're talking of trophies, not angels, not the other thing that we mentioned last night, which I don't remember what it was because it's not important. It's, <laughs> um, you know, becoming a joint heir with Christ and, knowing that we we come in into with him and we're we're honest in the in, in our dealings and what we want to do and we've worked for it and we've received of his grace to make up what the difference is um and i love that it, it's all it, you know it's all free um in the aspect of it nobody is banished from partaking of it like nobody is barred like i don't like you so no you can't have it um it's Everybody who's willing to, you know, as as Antonio was talking about, you know, live up to the standard that has been set. If you don't want to live up to the standard, then that's up to you. 
um, that God is a God of truth and truth has a standard. So Yeah, I, I like what you said there, where God has a standard and truth is that standard. <clears throat> and I think of like one of the standards that we, we do when we do all of our labors and our works in this life and for this, for everything we do should be for, uh, like President Joseph F. Smith said in your quote, uh, that our paramount duty is to labor for Zion and work for our own salvation, that we can gain the victory over ourselves and over the powers of evil that are in the world. And when I think about becoming a child of of light or becoming one of those a joint heir with Christ it's quite humbling to think about because of everything that the savior has gone through and he was like foreordained to do this and yet we still have that opportunity to partake in those same blessings and those same opportunities and it, it kind of also makes me think of like king david how he had those opportunities and then he lost them but we are still able to to have that and have that accessible because through through David through him Christ will come and in these final days Christ will come again and then we will be able to partake in more of those blessings with him and it just is uh I don't know every time I think about this subject and this topic it just it's fairly overwhelming <laughs> to, to think that we'll be known as joint heirs with Christ to be known as joint heirs with Savior with our Savior but we can't do priestcraft <laughs> we can't we can't not labor for Zion. Everything has to be done for those purposes and everything has to be directed towards Christ. But yeah, loved it. I thought that was great. All right. Anybody else? Nope. Go Mason. Okay. Perfect. Um, so I kind of went to John 1, 17 for my second insight, um, but I focus more on the truth part. Um, so I'll start off with reading that verse. Uh, so verse 17, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth come by Jesus Christ. So what do we do? What do we do when we hear him? What is our reaction when we hear the word of God? When we hear the truth, true doctrine, I would argue that one would feel compelled to share and to testify of those truths to join with those. Be a who witness. Speak. <laughs> yes, exactly. Be a witness. <laughs> um, and we, we would also want to join with those who also speak of the same truths, being witnesses with other witnesses, gathering with the gatherers, um, that they may edify one another and prepare to go forth teaching and leading others to truth. Um, so I did kind of a little scripture chain here. I took out some most of my words and just sort of filled it with just absolute pure doctrine and quotes. So uh, just bear with me for a minute as I get through this and hopefully make sense at the end. So I'm going to start in Alma 31 verse 5. Uh, and now, as the preaching of the word had a great tendency to lead the people to do that which was just, yea, it had a more powerful effect upon the minds of the people than the sword or anything else which happened unto them. Therefore, Alma thought it was expedient that they should try the virtue of the word of God. And now to quote Elder Neal A. Maxwell, he said, the word of God is more powerful than the sword or any other force. When it seems that nothing else is able, God's word has the power to heal and change us. Uh, end quote. And now this uh, these next two quotes are from the Preach My Gospel manual on Lesson 6 on how to develop Christ-like attributes, attributes, which is a couple of things we've been talking about. Um, virtue originates in your innermost thoughts and desires. It is a pattern of thought and behavior based on high moral standards. Since the Holy Ghost does not dwell in unclean tabernacles, virtue is a prerequisite to receiving the Spirit's guidance. When you choose to think and do or what you choose to think and do when you are alone and you believe no one is watching is a strong measure of your virtue. Virtuous people are clean and pure spiritually. They focus on righteous, uplifting thoughts and put unworthy thoughts that lead to inappropriate actions out of their minds. They obey God's commandments and follow the counsel of the church leaders to follow the prophet. They pray for the strength to resist temptation and do what is right. They quickly repent of any, any sins or wrongdoings, and they live worthy of a temple recommend. So there's a couple of things our current prophet has been asking us to do is daily repentance and to get to the temple more often to do work on both sides of the veil. Uh, now, if we jump to Hebrews 4, verse 12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and of a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Um, and this next quote comes from Elder Bednar. 
about true conversion. The essence of the gospel of Jesus Christ entails a fundamental and permanent change in our very nature made possible through the Savior's atonement. True conversion brings a change in one's beliefs, heart, and life to accept and conform to the will of God and includes a conscious commitment to become a disciple of Christ. Conversion is an enlarging, a deepening, and a broadening of the understanding base of the testimony. It is the result of revelation from God, accompanied by individual repentance, obedience, and diligence. Any honest seeker of truth can become converted by experiencing the mighty change of heart and being spiritually born of God. Conversion is an offering of self, of love, and of loyalty we give to God in gratitude for the gift of testimony. Close quote from Elder Bednar. Um, and then just a couple more scriptures in here and I'll wrap it up. But um, So in Hosea chapter 6, verse 5, it says, Therefore I have I hewn them by the prophets, and I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and thy judgments are as the light are as the light that go forth. Now, if we jump to Third Nephi chapter eleven, verse thirty-six, this is a footnote from Hosea. It says, and it came to pass while they were thus conversing one another, with one another, they heard a voice as it came out of heaven, and they cast their eyes round about, for they understood not the voice which they heard, and it was not a harsh voice, neither was it a loud voice. Nevertheless, and notwithstanding it being a small voice, it did pierce them that they did hear to the center, insomuch that there was no part of their frame that did cause to quake. Yea, it did pierce them that to the very soul, it did cause their hearts to burn. And again, the third time did they hear that voice, and it did open their ears to hear it. And their eyes were towards the sound thereof, and they did look steadfastly towards heaven from whence the sound came. And a third time, and behold, the third time they did not under they did understand the voice which they'd heard. And then verse seven, behold my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased, in whom I have glorified my name, hear ye him. And it came to pass as they understood. They cast their eyes up again towards the heaven, and behold, they saw a man descending out of heaven. And if we jump to verse 10, that man was the Savior, Jesus Christ. And he said, Behold, I am Jesus Christ, whom the prophets have testified come into the world. Behold, verily, verily, I say unto you, I will declare unto you my doctrine, which is God's word. And this is my doctrine, and it is the doctrine of the Father, which has given unto me. And I bear record of the Father, and the Father bear record of me. And the Holy Ghost beareth record of the Father and me, and I bear record of the Father that the Father commandeth all men everywhere to repent and believe in me. And then one last quote from uh, President Ezra Taft Benson on, on these verses. Um, he says, How few people in all the history of the word have heard the actual voice of God the Father speaking to them. As the people looked heavenward, they saw a man descend, descending out of heaven, and he was clothed in a white robe, and he came down and stood in the midst of them. A glorious resurrected being, a member of the Godhead, the creator of innumerable worlds, the God of Abraham, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob stood before their very eyes. Close quote. And sorry, this is from President Nelson. When the Holy Ghost is with you, you can teach truth, even when it runs counter to prevailing opinions, and you can ponder sincere questions about the gospel in an environment of revelation. Each time we have the faith to be obedient to God's laws, to God's laws, even when popular opinions belittle us, or each time we resist in entertainment or ideologies that celebrate covenant breaking, we are exercising our faith, which in turn increases our faith. Further, few things build faith more than does regular immersion in the Book of Mormon. No other book testifies of Jesus Christ with such power and clarity. Its prophets, as inspired by the Lord, saw our day and selected the doctrine and truths that would help us most. The Book of Mormon is our Latter-day Survival Guide. Of course, our ultimate security comes as we yoke ourselves to Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. Life without God is a life filled with fear. Life with God is a life filled with peace. Close quote from President Nelson. And this is from the Book of Mormon Student Manual, also on these verses. Ponder the spoken witness from Heavenly Father. Behold my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, in whom I have glorified my name. Hear ye him. Envision how you would have responded if you had been there for this announcement and the appearance of Jesus Christ, the crowning event of the Book of Mormon. Imagine how you would have felt when you heard the Son declare, Behold, I am Jesus Christ, who the promised prophets testified would come into the world. Consider the impact on the lives of those who received a spiritual and physical witness of the reality of Jesus Christ. And that is the end of my thought, too. I love that you say um, that quote, um, that the Book of Mormon is our Latter-day Survival Guide. I love that. Um, and I love the Book of Mormon. It, it's just so clear. Um, our lives now. I mean, you see that every 
every portion of it is a, a, a reminder, you know, of where we're at and what we're doing. It's, um, yeah. And it never fails when I'm going through something or I, I need something, I, I, I open it up and the answer is always there. Right. Yeah, I share, well, I won't get into it too much, but I share a little bit of a personal experience dealing with these verses um, in my final insight from when I was younger. And it's interesting because how, how President, like you said, President Nelson said it's a Latter-day Survival Guide. It was something, the Book of Mormon and learning how to actually properly study the scriptures was something that has navigated my life through the toughest things I've ever been through. And uh, learning, learning that and understanding that and having that testimony based off of Jesus Christ through the power of the Book of Mormon, through understanding what just happened here in, in these verses in Moroni, in uh, 35, chapter 3, verse 11. It was just re remarkable to me the first time I read that and actually understood what was happening. It was just absolutely life-changing. I hope that makes sense. I can go into my next insight because it actually dovetails really well with your last one. Um, because I talk about the importance of, of the scriptures a little bit more, um, which is the word which is truth. So in John 1 45, it says, Philip findeth Nathaniel and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. <clears throat> when when Philip told Nathaniel about Jesus, he said that he had found the person of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write. Philip and other disciples were able to recognize Jesus as the Messiah because they had been searching the scriptures for signs of the Messiah. The law was the first five books of Moses, while the prophets were books such as Isaiah, Micah, Jeremiah, etc. Later in his ministry, Jesus commanded his listeners to search the scriptures, which were the books of the Old Testament in his day, because they testified of him. So just a little bit of like um, the directives we've received from the scriptures about studying the scriptures and Doctrine and Covenants 1, search these commandments for they are true and faithful and the prophecies and promises which are in them shall all be fulfilled. First Nephi, <clears throat> and I did read many things unto them which were written in the books of Moses, but that I might more fully persuade them to believe in the Lord, the Redeemer. I did read unto them that which was written by the book prophet Isaiah, for I did liken all scripture unto us that it might be for our profit and learning. Matthew 4, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Um, First Nephi 11, and it came to pass that I beheld the rod of iron, which my father had seen was the word of God, which led to the fountain of living waters or to the tree of life, which waters are a representation of the love of God for, um, Sorry, of the love of God. And then um, first, second Nephi 25. For we labor diligently to write, to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ, to be reconciled to God. For we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. So with these scriptures that I mentioned above and with many more that we could add, we can see that the value of the scriptures and how they are invaluable to us, for us to treasure up in our minds and in our hearts because of the testimony and the witness they provide for us, especially in the latter days. We need to be diligent in our studies. We need not be lazy learners who rely solely upon others' research or commentary on what they study, on what they study. As we do this, hopefully, we will have the same kind of witness the former day saints had as they studied the words of the Old Testament and then saw the prophecies fulfilled before their eyes, and not the ignorance or the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, Sadducees, and other such Jews. We don't want to be found caught in a situation as described below from the New Testament student manual. When John denied that he was Elijah, the Jewish leaders asked him, art thou that prophet? Their question likely had reference to the prophecy of Moses in Deuteronomy. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren like unto me. Unto him ye shall hearken. However, by asking John if he was that prophet after John had already denied that he was the Christ, these Jews showed that they did not excuse me, understand the messianic nature of Moses's prophecies. Many of the Jews in Jesus's day anticipated the coming of a prophet who would be like unto Moses, but who was not the Messiah. This is evident when many in Jerusalem later proclaimed that Jesus was the prophet, while others declared that he was the Christ. So President Nelson, in several of his talks um, in the last couple of years, where he has given us steps of, of to have faith, gain spiritual momentum, and overcome the world, have all included the scriptures. 
He says, to do anything well requires effort. Becoming a true disciple of Jesus Christ is no exception. Increasing your faith and trust in him takes effort. May I offer five suggestions to help you develop the faith and trust. First study, be, first study, become an engaged learner. Immerse yourself in the scriptures to understand better Christ's mission and ministry. Know the doctrine of Christ so that you understand its power for your life. The more you learn about the Savior, the easier it will be, it will be to trust his mercy, his infinite love, and his strengthening, healing, and redeeming power. My third suggestion, and this is a different talk, um, Learn about God and how he works. With frightening speed, a testimony that is not nourished daily by the word of God can crumble. Thus, the antidote to Satan's scheme is clear. We need daily experiences worshiping the Lord and studying his gospel. I plead with you to get to, to let God prevail in your life. Give him a fair share of your time. As you do, notice what happens to your positive spiritual momentum. Another quote, what does it mean to overcome the world? It means overcoming the temptation to care more about the things of this world than the things of God. It means trusting in the doctrine of Christ more than the philosophies of men. It means delighting in truth, denouncing deception, and becoming humble followers of Christ. Overcoming the world is not an event that happens in a day or two. It happens over a lifetime as we repeatedly embrace the doctrine of Christ. Another uh, last quote for this section, nourish yourselves in the words of ancient and modern prophets. And this was given actually to young single adults. This is not a general conference address. If you have questions, and I hope you do, seek answers with the fervent desire to believe, learn all you can about the gospel, and be sure to turn to faith-filled, truth-filled sources for guidance. Immerse yourself in the rich reservoir of revelation we have at our fingertips. Um, he also gives us invitations to study the promises of the house of Israel and then watch for those promises to be filled in our lives. And then most recently, he said, my dear brothers and sisters, so many wonderful things are ahead. In coming days, we will see the greatest manifestations of the Savior's power that the world has ever seen. Between now and the time he returns with power and great glory, he will bestow countless privileges, blessings and miracles upon the faithful. So how do you think President Nelson can have so much confidence in these manifestations or even have any idea of what they are? The same way we can, by reading the scriptures, being children of light, and watching for the prophecies taking place before our very eyes, just as um, the prophecies were taking place before the Jews' very eyes at the coming of Christ. I testify that the Lord's second coming is right around the bend, and that President Nelson knows the time period we are currently in regarding the last day's timeline. He is trying the best he can to help saints prepare themselves to be the saints, to welcome the Savior. And that ends my second insight. All right, that, <clears throat> that was awesome. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. Sorry, my I had to charge my, I'm on my iPhone because I forgot my work computer doesn't have a camera. <laughs> um, so I had to pause to charge it for a second. <clears throat> but I liked what you um, mentioned there right at the very end, um, how President Nelson, how can he have so much confidence in what he's telling us and teaching us? And um, uh, what else was there? And also how how we as saints can help him in, in that, what he's trying to do. And I remember, I think it was one of his first talks is when he was called as an apostle, and he just hammers right into being Israel <laughs> and right into our covenants and right into Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He just, he goes just full fledged right into that right off the bat. And uh, I was just, I'm like, man, like that was back in, was it like 84 or 85? I think when he was called to be an I apostle. wasn't alive then. <laughs> oh, I think I was. I think I was, <laughs> I think I was a baby. I was probably like a few months old. <laughs> and so uh, I don't, I don't remember experiencing it, but I remember just watching it. But, um, yeah, it was, I, from right then, I'm like, man, because listening to his talks, just since he's been called a prophet, as to be the prophet, have, like, he's been hammering on that a lot as well, mm -hmm. as, like, the power in the priesthood, being covenant Israel, remaining true to your covenants, like, finding that spiritual power and strength to stay strong, to discern between what's right and wrong, and if it's not true or it's not correct, toss it out, don't even deal with it. Um and going back to what you'd mentioned too about how we have these desires for nothing more to not really be in the world or be of the world anymore, but to just sort of toss things aside and focus more on Christ. And I think that's a way we can help him, our, help our prophet today to get this message out, to be true disciples is to find those things that are holding us back and just toss them out. And the more we focus on the Savior, I found, the more willing I am to delve deeper into the scriptures, to spend more time 
with with good saints like you guys doing things like this. And the last time I want to do the stuff I used to do, it just would waste my time. But anyways, I really like that insight. I really loved these two back to back. They really did go so well together. Um, I was thinking because Mason touched on how the word is quick and powerful, right? You had some of those quotes in there. And I was just thinking there really is, it really is powerful hearing reading scriptures or hearing scripture read, right? And that's something that actually attracted me to the Zyner Bust group. So I'm like, when I listen to firesides, when I listen to like, what are, you know, content or things in the chat, I'm like, it's, it's scripture a lot of the time. And, and that is so powerful. Just hearing that, like, they're really, there is a very real tangible power in those words, right? And I almost used the quick and powerful quote in one of my insights. And there was a quote from one of the manuals. And it was like, it was a different one. It's like Doctrine and Covenants or something. Um, but it was pointing out how quick doesn't mean necessarily fast, but alive. Mm -hmm. Like, like as in quicken, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, it's alive and powerful. <laughs> and yeah. Anyway, I, I loved those two back to back. Yeah, if it will. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, speaking of words, I'll, I'll go ahead and find my uh, final point um, about words and how powerful they can be. Um, <clears throat> in John 1 47, um, we read Jesus saw Nathaniel coming onto him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. So um, several Hebrew words are translated uh, guile in the Old Testament, and each of them means deceit, treachery, dishonesty, as in Psalms 32, which says, blessed is the man who unto the Lord impuneth not iniquity and in whose spirit there is no guile. In the student manual for this section, it says without guile. While discussing the Savior's statement that Nathaniel was a person in whom there is no guile, Elder Joseph B. Worthlin of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained that it, it means to be what it means to be without guile. To be without guile is to be free of deceit, cunning, hypocrisy, and dishonesty in thought or action. To be guile is to deceive or lead astray. Free scrap. Mm -hmm. As Lucifer beguiled Eve in the Garden of Eden, a person without guile is a person of innocence, honest intent, and pure motives, whose life reflects the simple practice of conforming his daily actions to principles of integrity. To be without guile is to be pure in heart, an essential virtue of those who would be counted among true followers of Christ. If we are without guile, we are with we are honest, true, and righteous. All of these attributes of deity and are required of the saints. Those who are honest are fair and truthful in their speech, straightforward in their dealings, free of deceit and above stealing, misrepresentation, or any other fraudulent action. I believe the necessity for the members of the church to be without guile may be more urgent now than at any other times because many in the world apparently do not understand the importance of this virtue. Um, just in my thoughts this week have been about really uh, impressed upon me that um, my thoughts needed to be, you know, um, on those things, you know, that are virtuous. And um I found uh, in a correlation to um, this scripture um, in the Journal of Discourses, Lorenzo Snow um, uh, stated, in occupying the time this morning, I wish in the first place to call your attention to the fact that we are Latter-day Saints, or at least ought to be, and that as such, we are dependent upon the Lord for our instruction. This is in accordance with our faith that we have to look to him for assistance under all circumstances, in all places, in all our affairs of life, 
and in all matters pertaining to furthering us on in the principles of godliness. Assembled together as we are this evening, mm -hmm. it is very necessary that we ask the Lord for his spirit, the spirit of inspiration to rest upon us as speakers and as hearers, that we may be enabled to comprehend things that may be spoken and that they may be adapted to our individual needs. He further says, should not the bishop who operates in our temporal matters be a very wise and good man? Certainly he should, a man of honor and integrity, full of the Holy Ghost, loving his neighbor as himself, and loving the Lord our God with all his might, mind, and strength. And blessed is he whom these two principles are developed, for such a one is without condemnation. He stands the peer of him referred to in the scriptures by the Savior as one without guile. In John 1, 47, the people will soon learn to confide in such a man as he can establish unmistakable proof before God and before his brethren that he obeys these commandments in which are involved, are involved in all the prophets ever lived for. In D&C 124, 20, again, it tells us, and again, verily I say unto you, my servant George Miller is without guile. He may be trusted because of the integrity of his heart and for the love which he has to my testimony. I, the Lord, love him. I love that, that um, I, I don't know if these are compliments or just statements, but um, I love that the Lord um, says that of these men. And I just want to testify to you that uh, that I know that the Savior looks upon your heart. That is that, and I, I want to share part of a spiritual, spiritual experience that I had. And so in relation to what he saw, um, you know, how he saw Nathaniel, because he didn't meet Nathaniel until he came up, you know, he came and then he told him you're Nathaniel and um, you were underneath a tree. And he kind of told him, and he says that he was in, you know, as he said that he was an Israelite and he was without guile. And, uh, and there's more instances in where um, this virtue is um, mentioned. Um, to me, I interpret it or understand that this is that the Savior looks at you, you know, and knows you um, completely. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're, you know, um, what you've done and what you're going to do based on all of these experiences you have. Um, the uh, ex spiritual experience that I want to share is, um, um, and I think I've shared with, with the sisters previously before, um, that I had a dream vision of the Savior years ago when I first became a member. And um, in that um experience I wanted to share that um, when I um, was able to finally uh, stand up and uh, see the Savior I was able to look into his eyes and when I looked into his eyes I can only describe um, as I've shared before just looking at a vast ocean of love that's that's the best I could describe it was just endless and broad and deep and, and and just overwhelming love but more importantly that was me looking in but what I felt was his his um when he looked at me I felt and that his sight went in through my eyes, into my internal body, all the way down to the tips of my toes and back up again, all the way through. It was just kind of like a scan all the way up and down. I mean, it was so piercing that that's what I felt and that he knew every inch or, you know, cell in my body through and through. And so that's what, um, um, I, I can only imagine what it's going to be, you know, when we do at some point, you know, is see the savior, you know, um, uh, I don't know that I can look at him eye to eye because it's just so, it's overwhelming. But um, 
that's what it means to um, that the Lord looks at you in your heart, know the person that you are, your intents, your heart. And is it without guile? Do we? Um, how how um, do are we uh, men and women of honor and integrity? Are we full of the Holy Ghost? Do we truly love our neighbors as ourselves? And I don't mean our physical neighbors. I mean every single one of us. I, I know that I have a great love for each and every one of you and all of those in Zion of us. And, and, and I guess that makes it easy because we each are, are, are knowing each other, right? But do we love that neighbor that we deem that they're not worthy of it, of that love? Um, I can tell you that this week has been a incredibly difficult. Uh, to express that when you have someone that um, um, is on a, on a lost path and you want to share the truth and the knowledge that you do know and that they're going down a very wicked path and it, my heart breaks for them but you still find the, that you have an incredible love for them because you know that their choices are down a, a, a wrong path. So I think that somewhere in between there, that's what having no guile is, is just being able to tap into that incredible love that the Savior uh, is. And um, that that was my thought. Those were my thoughts on uh, having no guile. But honesty, truth, integrity, that's all wrong one. If you can't get past that, then literally nothing else matters. Yeah. That, <clears throat> that quote you shared from Elder Joseph B. Worth, and I, I had it on my last point. <laughs> and then I, I got and I got I got rid of it. And I, I'm glad I did because then you shared that. But man, that led it to that experience that you had perfectly. And um what a what a special thank you for sharing that. I've never heard that before. That that that's amazing. And when I think of the one standing without guile, I think of like now that I can connect those two, is someone being ready and prepared to meet the Savior. Is someone like Tracy said, being able to get past rung one, there's so much more <laughs> readily available for us if we are willing to just get above those things that are holding us back, to be honest, to be without guile. And to just keep moving on, onward, the blessings, like we talked about before, to be joint heirs with Christ, to stand beside him, to look him in the eye. It's just incredible. Yeah. Thank you, Antonio. That was, that was a, I love that. That was beautiful. I don't feel like I have anything to add, but thank you. Oh, my next. Three Z's. <laughs> Three Z's. <laughs> Three Z's. <laughs> All right. From the Come Follow Me manual. I think Tracy read this earlier. Have you ever wondered whether you would have recognized Jesus of Nazareth as the son of God if you had been alive during his mortal ministry? For years, faithful Israelites, including Andrew, Peter, Philip, and Nathaniel, had waited and prayed for the coming of the promised Messiah. When they met him, how did they know that he was the one they had been seeking? The same way all of us come to know the Savior, by accepting the invitation to come and see for ourselves. We read about him in the scriptures, we hear his doctrine, we observe his way of living, we feel his spirit. Along the way, we discover, as Nathaniel did, that the Savior knows us and loves us and wants to prepare us to receive greater things. So we come to know the Savior as we follow him, exercise faith in him, and become his sons and daughters. 1 Nephi 22, 25 says, And he gathereth his children from the four quarters of the earth, 
and he numbereth his sheep, and they know him. And there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Um, I didn't put any other commentary on here, but, you know, how will we know him when we see him if we are his children? If we are his we'll sheep, know his voice. We will know his voice and we will be bound with him. That's something that um, was in a, a recent Ensign article. I think it was October from President Nelson. He talks, it's the everlasting covenant. Um, and he talks about how covenants bind us to the Savior. Um, and we'll be know, we'll know him because we will hear his voice and we will be like him when we see him. Um, but I also wanted to talk more about that last part. I love the interaction between Jesus and Nathaniel at the end of John 1. We don't get a lot of detail, but it is powerful nonetheless. And I'll just read it real quick. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there in whom is no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see the heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The Savior knows each of us individually. And I encourage you to think back and remember a time when you knew, really knew, that Jesus Christ is aware of you personally and knows your needs, desires, and circumstances. One of these moments occurred for Nathaniel when Jesus revealed that he saw Nathaniel under the fig tree. That was apparently um, a significant moment for him. I have had many experiences with God under my own fig trees. <laughs> However, as precious as these experiences are, I also know that as we each continue in faith, we will see even greater things than these. 3 Nephi 26, 9 says, And when they shall have received this, which is expedient that they should have first to try their faith, and if it shall so be that they shall believe these things, then shall the greater things be made manifest unto them. President Nelson, last conference, said, Those who live the higher laws of Jesus Christ have access to his higher power. Thus, covenant keepers are entitled to a special kind of rest that comes to them through their covenantal relationship with God. From Doctrine and Covenants 84, 24, which rest is the fullness of his glory. And I will just end with this quote from Parley P. Pratt. If we were to say that before the coming of the Lord, many great things await us, and that we are prepared for all the changes which, ha which have to take place, and that they are nearer at hand than we would imagine them to be. And if we should say that that event was much nearer than many of us suppose, and that we have already received many warnings, most certainly we ought to prepare to receive greater covenants, to become more closely acquainted with the Spirit of God, to be more perfect in union, to know how to act more in concert, to overcome our weaknesses and errors of judgment and ignorance and follies. Learn to be happy and to come up to the mark and be sanctified before the Lord, that peradventure some portion of the keys and powers from the eternal world may be more fully bestowed upon us, that we may be prepared by gradual experience from time to time that we may progress in the science and plan of salvation and be prepared for the greater things that await us. 
I will not complain of our deficiencies, for we have been satisfied which, with the things which we have accomplished. But we have full confidence in the union and power that attends this work. It is for us to prepare and to repent of all our errors and follow our leaders until we reach celestial glory. The powers of heaven are neither ashamed nor afraid, but they have confidence in us and will dwell in our society. There are a great many keys and manifestations and preparations and associations between us and that great and perfect day when the Lord will come in the power of heaven. Let us all do our duty and be faithful to our covenants. May God bless you all. Amen. I love that right there where he says, for adventure, some portion of the keys and the powers from the eternal world may be more fully bestowed upon us that we may be prepared by gradual experience from time to time. That is exciting. Mm -hmm. and I just, this makes me think of like being favored, right? Those who live the higher laws of Jesus Christ have access to his higher power, i.e. they're favored, you know, um, and we choose to be favored by the way in which we choose to live our lives. And then we can receive the fullness of his glory, which is synonymous with exaltation, right? Um, Christ received a fullness after all that he did. Um, and that is the life that God lives, which is exaltation. And that's what our ultimate goals should be as children of our heavenly father. Yeah, I agree. That, that whole time you're reading that quote from Parley P. Pratt, the, the one thing that kept running through my mind over and over again was the school of Joseph's boys. Because um, that right there, we're preparing to receive greater covenants. We continue to learn we're overcoming our weaknesses, our errors of judgment, our ignorances and our follies. We're learning to be happy and come up to the mark, not shooting past it, not being stuck on rung one. <laughs> and like I... I it was something like when I first heard about the Joseph's boys classes, it, it was just like, as the second I heard about it, I was like, what is this? I need to do this. <laughs> and then I started to learn a, bit, a little bit more about it. I'm like, Oh, it's like a class. <laughs> it's like all these different topics to learn about. And uh, I just felt like this duty and obligation to go through it. And I took it really seriously. And I had some of the greatest spiritual experiences to me personally running through those courses um, that really strengthened my testimony, not only in the prophet Joseph Smith, but in our really what our divine purpose is on this earth. And I love how he said that here. It's to prepare to receive greater things. It's to prepare to do greater works. And like, I, I love teaching the gospel. I love sharing the gospel. I love bearing my testimony. And I, I love trying to do my best to be a part of gathering Israel on both sides of the veil. But I'm more excited for the work that's to come, too. And the school of Joseph's boys and doing stuff like this has just given me such a better understanding of it. And that was just something that really ran through my mind going through that. It's just those next steps that we come to. And there's a lot more to look forward to and to be excited about. But mm -hmm. yeah, I love that quote. That's great. The whole insight was great. But... <clears throat> so I guess, is it me next? You're next. You're up. This Three is my G's. last. What's that? Three G's. Three G's. <laughs> hey, Tracy. <laughs> oh, that's good. Good on you, Antonia. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I hit a little bit on. Um, let's see here on John chapter one. Uh, verses 45 through 51 as well, but I took it a little in a little bit different way, I think, but still the same. So hopefully it'll make sense. And this isn't a 2 a.m. rambling. It's like a 3 p.m. in the afternoon rambling, which all my thoughts are ramblings, but um, <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so I, there was two questions from the Preach My Gospel that I put in here because I, I really liked them and it kind of, I don't know, it's kind of interesting in preparing these three insights my mind just kept going back to this experience i had as a kid and and to third nephi chapters 8 through 11 i don't 
it's weird reading in the Old Testament. My mind was on the Book of Mormon the entire time. And um, so I threw this experience in here and I hope it's okay that I shared this. But anyways, I'll just get to it. Uh, so in John chapter one, verse 35 through 46, this question that's asked and preach my gospel, it says, what are the results of John's testimony? What can your family learn from the people described in these verses about how to share the gospel? Um, so I just gave a quick, simple answer was, and we talked about this earlier with Tracy's first point, was that he found Jesus and brought others unto the Savior, and those in turn also followed the Savior <clears throat> and brought others unto Christ. Uh, and then the second question it stems from John 1, 45, verse 50, to 45 to 51. What did Nathaniel do that helped him gain a testimony of the Savior? Invite family members to talk about how they've gained how they have gained their testimonies. And so I just shared verse 51. I won't read through all of them again, but <clears throat> it says, And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So he, he when he taught the Savior talks to Nathaniel, he's telling him there that he'll be able to see the heavens open. He's having these this spiritual experience. And that's what uh, so then I wanted to share this quote from Elder Bruce R. McConkie. It's titled, What's, What Was Nathaniel, Nathaniel's Experience Under the Fig Tree? And to quote, Pres uh, to quote Elder McConkie, he says, Jesus here exercises his powers of seership. From the fragmentary account preserved in the scripture, it is apparent that Nathaniel had undergone some surpassing spiritual experience while praying or meditating or worshiping under a fig tree. The Lord and giver of all things spiritual, though absent in body, had been present with Nathaniel in spirit. And the guileless Israelite, seeing this manifestation of seership, was led to accept Jesus as the Messiah. So it's it's interesting, like I think back to Antonia's uh, ex experience she shared, like the, the how to, in order to gain a, a better understanding of who our Savior is and to gain a testimony of him, he doesn't have to be here in the body. It's through understanding how to hear him and to where to find it, to hear him through the scriptures or through the words of the prophets is what really draws us near to Christ. And when we go back to our discussion earlier on the light of Christ and on truth and on those piercing words that we hear when testimonies are born, that, that's how we work together to learn more about Christ and become more committed to him. And so I'll just share this uh, experience I had with you guys quick, and hopefully it doesn't sound too out of control. You can stop me if it does, but... <laughs> um, so this is a story that I ha happened to me when I was 11 years old. And uh, I feel like it wraps my three insights together quite nicely. Um, so this is about my great grandfather. And just to tell you a little bit about him, he was a terrifying man. <laughs> and he was like barely five feet tall and I'm six foot one and he still scared the heck out of me. But I mean, I was 11, <laughs> so I was a lot shorter than him back then. But if he was alive today, I'd still be terrified of him. But he was from Wales, so he had this really thick Welsh accent. And my dad used to joke that when he was a baby, instead of getting a pacifier, they gave him a tobacco pipe because <laughs> he smoked a pipe like his entire life. Ooh. And so, um, what's that? Yeah. So anyways, he was just had this raspy, croaky voice, and he was terrifying. Anyways, the night before my great-grandfather passed away, my father, my uncle, and I went to visit him in the hospital, and he had a really bad case of pneumonia. <clears throat> so we know he didn't have much time left. And my father asked him while we were there if he'd like a priesthood blessing or even a prayer to help comfort him. And one thing I forgot to mention, he was did not believe in God. He was atheist and hated the church and always let us know his thoughts <laughs> on it. Uh, so after my father had offered him a priesthood blessing or even a prayer to help comfort him, he refused. And what he said next was something that really pained me for a lot of years. Uh, he exclaimed, no, I don't want any of your pity. I want none of your religion. There is no God, there is no heaven, and there is no hell. When we die, it all goes black. There is nothing for us after this life. We just stop existing. Then he turned on his side and refused to speak with us any longer. When we left the room, when we left his hospital room, my uncle looked at, at my father and he said, well, he's in for quite a surprise. They both laughed. And from that point on, I don't remember any more of the conversation because those final words that I had heard my great grandfather speak brought a plethora of doubts, questions, and dark thoughts to my mind. What if my great grandfather was right? What if there was just nothing, just emptiness and darkness? Mm -hmm. I started to question everything I knew about God, the afterlife and our afterlife and our purpose on earth. I used to lay awake at night, afraid that I might die in my sleep and never again experience light, only fading away into an empty void of darkness and nothingness. 
I used to have these nightmares of just not existing and being utterly alone with not a soul to talk to, not a light to shine, no friends, no family. After years of dealing with this, I was frustrated and I was exhausted. I finally decided to fill my parents in and ask for help. <clears throat> my father gave me some of the best advice that a child struggling in the darkness could, could have ever received. He told me to pray and read the scriptures. Pretty primary answers. But then he expounded on that a little bit more. <laughs> he explained that there is light within the scriptures because they are filled with truth. To find out what happens after we die, I must turn to sources of light and truth, not to a crotchety old Welchman. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Grandpa. Um, <laughs> uh, he told me that a great place to start was start at was at the back of the scriptures at the Bible dictionary and the topical guide. Anytime I had a doubt or a fear creeping in about a certain topic, that I should search it out in those sections and I should read about it then write down any scriptures that are referenced, then read those scriptures, pray to Heavenly Father and ask him, to help, ask him to help me understand them. So I did exactly that. I sat down with a set of scriptures. I looked up everything possible I could think of that I was struggling with. But the one scripture passage that had really cleared things up for me and had dispelled the darkness from my mind is when I had read 3 Nephi chapters 8 through 11 for the very first time. Something I had learned in those chapters was that when a group of people or a person is at their weakest and their darkest moments, they can still find peace. They can still find comfort and they can have light. That light which comes to us through Jesus Christ is a gift from our Father in heaven. And that light is far brighter and much more superior to any darkness that may try to overshadow us. And I'll end this insight with a quote from President Nelson's talk that I feel sums up nicely a lot of these things that I learned from this experience and how it was a starting point for my testimony and my love for my Savior and his word within the scriptures. To quote President Nelson, Repeatedly past prophets have declared great marvelous things unto the people, which they did not believe. It is no different in our day. Most people do not embrace these truths, either because they do not know where to look for them, or because they are listening to those who do not have the whole truth, or because they have rejected the truth. Whenever he was introduced, his only begotten son, to, whenever God introduced his only begotten son to mortals upon the earth, he had done so with remarkably few words. On the Mount of Transfiguration to Peter, James, and John, God said, this is my beloved son, hear him. His words to the Nephites in ancient Bountiful were, behold my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, in whom I have glorified my name, hear ye him. And to Joseph Smith in that profound de declaration that opened this dispensation, God simply said, this is my beloved son, hear him. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, consider the fact that in these three instances just mentioned, just before the father introduced the son, the people involved were in a state of fear and to some degree desperation. The apostles were afraid that, that they saw Jesus Christ encircled by a cloud on the Mount of Transfiguration. The Nephites were afraid because they'd been through destruction and darkness for several days. Joseph Smith was in the grips of a force of darkness just before the heavens opened. Our Father knows that when we are surrounded by uncertainty and fear, what will help us the very most is to hear his son. Because when we seek to hear, truly hear his son, we will be guided to know what to do in any circumstance. God gives us the patterns for success, happiness, and joy in this life. We are to hear the words of the Lord, hearken to them, and heed what he has told us. We can go to the scriptures. They teach us about Jesus Christ and his gospel, the magnitude of his atonement, and our Father's great plan of happiness and redemption. Daily immersion in the word of God is crucial for spiritual survival, especially in these days of increasing upheaval. As we feast on the words of Christ daily, the words of Christ will tell us how to respond to difficulties we never thought we would ever face. Close quote from President Nelson. And I'll just close with my words. After spending so long in confusion and darkness <clears throat> through that experience, I was filled with the light of Christ. It was lighting up the truth and I was no longer in darkness. I was gaining knowledge and an understanding of how the scriptures are the word of God and how they testify of Jesus Christ who had suffered and died for us and was resurrected so that we will all live again. I had come to know and started to gain a testimony that we will not just fade away into nothingness, that there is life after death, and that we truly have a divine purpose in this life. I had heard the words of Christ, I had heard the truth, and I was changed because of it. And that ends my third phrase thoughts. <laughs> Thank you, Mason. I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed the part where you, you know, went to your father and that he uh, directed you to the scriptures and not just directed you, but told you when you have a question, this is what you do. It's 
uh, such an amazing thing to be able to have parents that, you know, goodly parents that, you know, know um, what to do when you have a child that's, you know, seeking answers. And it's just, it was a, a thank you. I really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. It goes to what you had said earlier, um, Tracy, about um, we're supposed to lead them to the light. You know, we're not supposed to, you know, be the light. We're supposed to lead them to the light. And that's a perfect example of how his father, you know, did that, you know, and directed him in that way. And this is where the light is. And that's where he found, you know, his testimony and um, his experience. Well, and that's how we gain these these experiences and like moments with the test or with with the Holy Ghost, right? We have to put ourselves in, into positions to um, have these experiences, and if we don't, then we're not hearing Him. We can't hear Jesus; He's not going to appear to us. Um, it, it's it's actually really rare, <laughs> you know, to have a Joseph Smith or an Alma or a Paul experience. Um, it's more common um as elder bednar describes it in some videos that he did for seminary you know that it's it's more like the sunrise like you get it gradually line upon line um searching for it and and being diligent and that's what is really the most important is that that diligence keeping at it being perseverant um and not you know getting a, a hit here and a hit there because that's not how it works um, and so I, I really appreciate your dad. And I think he, he did so much for you just by leading you to where that light is, where the, the word of God is, um, that sword that cuts asunder and, and just makes everything so clear. And we can understand through, um, the, the Holy ghost who bears witness of those things. Yeah. It's, um, that, that was something that like I'll always cherish and remember it was that like, that's something I've always done when things got hard or things get tough. Like you, you can always find, I just learned earlier on that you can always find those answers in the scripture. And it was almost kind of like, he gave me my own little like pyramid of truth to build off of <laughs> was he was like, well, don't listen to, to people that are making you feel bad or people that are telling you lies or, or telling you things mm -hmm. that are wrong. Like, obviously that didn't digest and sit well with, I was having like an existential crisis at 11, you know? And uh, so, but it was like, no, you, you base your thoughts, you base your feelings off of truth and you go straight to the doctrine. And it's like, well, what does the savior say about this? What do, what do the prophets teach about this? And it was just, and I feel like because of that, um, like growing up and getting older and, and uh, being faced with more trials, i was always able to lean on and turn towards the scriptures or the prophets or prayer for those answers instead of going to some random person on on youtube or somebody mm -hmm. that didn't quite know what i was going through and gave you really bad advice you know and i, I just always kind of felt like it was necessary to stick to that to those means of, of learning uh, i apologize if this is a repeat but um i i just want to echo how awesome it is that like your dad directed you not just to the scriptures, right? He could have like quoted a scripture to you, right? Or said like, go look here. But the fact that he taught you how to search the scriptures, yeah, look things up and, and search and find by the spirit and let the spirit guide you as you make those connections yourself. That's so awesome. Oh yeah. The, yeah. Like the Bible dictionary and the inde uh, index on the top of God are like my best friends. <laughs> and now it's like the journal just courses and scripture citation <laughs> index. And Discord, like, You've okay. just graduated. It's okay. Yeah, you, you, <laughs> you up the game. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me, let me just finish my last thought here. Cause it kind of, again, goes with, with Mason's thought. So I'm going back to what we've talked about before, becoming sons and daughters, both Antonia and um, Renee hit on this. And a lot of the scripture I have here is, is the Joseph Smith translation. You can see all the greens, but it says, but as many as received him to them, gave he power to become the sons of God only to them 
who believe on his name. For in the beginning was the word, even the son who was made flesh and sent unto us by the will of the father. And as many as believe on his name shall receive of his fullness and of his fullness, we have all received even immortality and eternal life through his grace. For the law was given through Moses, but life and truth came through Jesus Christ. So I won't read some of the things that have already been read regarding um, like the New Testament student manual. I do like this line. Although we are sp all spirit daughters and sons of God, the father, when we sin, we become estranged and separated from him. Jesus Christ offers a way back through his atoning sacrifice. The savior shares with us his fullness as described in John, including his grace, which he freely gives unto us. Um, so my commentary on that part um, in particular is God actually has given us many things freely. Um, here are some scriptures. He doeth that which is good among the children of men, and he doeth nothing save it be plain unto the children of men, and he inviteth them all to come unto him and partake of his goodness, and denieth none that come unto him, black and white, bond and free, male and female, and he remembereth the heathen, and all are alike unto God, both Jew and Gentile. So everyone will have the opportunity to choose to make covenants with the Father, thus becoming children of Christ. In Mosiah 5, um, Rene read that scripture, becoming children of Christ through covenants. In 3 Nephi 9, the Savior himself says, Yea, verily I say unto you, if ye will come unto me, ye shall have eternal life. Hold, my arm of mercy is extended towards you, and whoever will come, him will I receive. And blessed are those who come unto me. So Christ will receive us, but we have to come to him. We have to fulfill the requirements. He has a standard and he turns none away who are willing to live that, by that standard. The standard is also true and never changes. And that's how we can exercise faith in him. And we have to do all that we can to receive his grace. And that goes back to the New Testament part where it talks about um, truth, um, you know, full of knowledge and, and truth. Um, and in Second Nephi 25, it says, for we labor diligently to write and persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God. For we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. So to kind of sum, sum it all up, um, one, Jesus turns away none from searching him out. Two, he has a standard by which we must live, live by to receive, to be received by him. And I, I think that dovetails nicely with Renee's um, other definitions of what it means to receive Jesus Christ or be received by him. Three, as we decide to live by his standard, he gives us power to actually be changed, um, our very nature. And the standard never changes, which allows us to fully have faith in him. We do all in our power, which is given, that power is given to us through our diligence before we can be saved by grace, which is then the power that makes it the difference of what we couldn't do. And thus through this process, we become the children of Christ and also joint heirs with him in the kingdom of God. And that ends my last thought. I love that. I could talk about being sons and daughters of Christ for a long time. <laughs> um, it just, it's like, it's the quintessential or the culmination of the plan of salvation, right? Mm -hmm. Christ was sent here. He's, he's the, cor the cornerstone. He's the hinge point. He's, you know, everything hangs on him. And if we're becoming his sons and daughters, then we're fulfilling that very plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know if it's something you said or just a thought that I had. I'm actually not sure. <laughs> but just the, um, and, and maybe this was connecting what you were saying toward the beginning, that that we're children of God in two ways, right? That That we are, spirit children of our heavenly father and and that will never change we will always be that but being a child of christ is a, is different and that's something that we choose to do and when i was looking at some things i didn't put put this in mind but as i was looking it up it's like there's a category or a i don't know a thing in the index that's family comma children comma duties of and I was like oh mm. duties of children right and just that it, it just goes along with all the other things that 
that we and others have been talking a lot about recently and, and in conference, like choosing to be chosen, right? What does it mean to have power to become a son or daughter? It's it's power to do what children do, <laughs> right? It's like a role that we have to choose to take upon ourselves and take on the responsibilities of. And what is it that children do? Obey their parents and become like their parents. And that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to obey Jesus Christ and become like Jesus Christ. And that's like our role as children if we choose to do those things, right? But anyway. Yeah. So let's choose. Let's do it. Yeah. In, um, oh, where was I looking that up? Um, when you're talking about being the, the children of Christ. Um, sorry, I just had a quote here. Oh, here it is. <clears throat> From Elder Paul Piper. He, he says, our Heavenly Father wants to make it absolutely clear that the name of his son, Jesus Christ, is not simply one name among many. The Savior's name has a singular and essential power. It is the only name by which salvation is possible. By emphasizing this truth in every dispensation, our loving Father assures us, assures all of his children that there is a way back to him. By having a sure way available does not mean that our return is automatically assured. God tells us that our action is required. Wherefore, wherefore all men and women must take upon them the name which is given of the Father. <clears throat> and so I, I love... Um, I think it, actually, I think it was you, Tracy, you, you gave, did you give a talk in church and you posted it in your work on becoming the children of light? Is that your t church talk or sacrament uh, talk? No. Oh, okay. Sorry. Maybe it was somebody I else. did but... talk about children becoming children of light. Was it last week, Renee? In uh, Sisters in Zion. It was either last week or the week before. Okay. I don't well, know if maybe I, that's what you're referring to. I don't know. But no, I did not give a talk in a sacrament meeting. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. Or maybe it's a little paper or something, but I, I remember it was, I very first joined up on Discord and I'm, I was looking through all the threads and there was a year work one and I clicked on it and it was somebody had, had a talk on it or something. And it was like, it really, and that quote was in there and it really kind of made me think about like taking on the, upon the name of Christ, mm -hmm. like working out our salvation here how they say like is it was it president nelson that says salvation is an individual thing but exaltation is a family matter mm -hmm. and when, when i think about family it's not just you know mom dad kids it's it's all of israel coming together as sons and daughters of heavenly father as children of the light as children of christ coming together to be those joint heirs with our savior and that to me is what it, it's like to be that in that family is receiving that um uh, those promises and those gifts together, working it out, not uh, carrying the load by ourselves. Going back to Antonia's mm -hmm. quote from John Taylor. But, yeah. Anyways, I really enjoyed that. Yeah. Awesome guys. Well, thank you for joining us, Mason. We've enjoyed having you. Uh, it was great. a little Thanks. bit longer, but we hope that you guys stayed with us. Renee and I are fading. <laughs> <laughs> we're moms of little kids <laughs> we're like yes. that's okay but um I I just John was awesome I <laughs> there was so much that you could pull from John that it was so hard to narrow it down so be glad that this was only almost two and a half hours instead of longer <laughs> well I my last thought on the uh, uh my insight was going to be on uh opening the heavens and that that was a really long I said well, I'm glad that I <laughs> Antonia, you are awesome. We love you. I love you guys too. All okay, right. Well, well like an awesome insight. Another, another... Put it in the doc so we can read it. Oh, later. yeah, there you go. Add it to the doc. Yeah. I will. Well, another chapter, ladies and gents. <laughs> well, Good night. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Later. See you guys next week. <laughs> All right. We'll see you for our next one. Okay. <laughs>